All right, why don't you walk me through from a patient's perspective, because you see patients, uh, applications, walk me through what steps are required for approval of these agents for the patients. I know we've done a sort of piecemeal. Put it all together for me. Sure. So there's usually a, 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 an online form, a fax form, or um, medical necessity letter of, of, uh, uh, that has to be submitted. These are higher costs. I mean, let's face it. That's why. That's why there's. Well, why don't we stop for a second? How much higher? Well, the what do these things cost? Uh, over five hundred dollars per month. We okay. usually start with the, what's called the WAC price per month, uh, and then we have high deductible plans. So patients are typically paying off of that WAC. So they may be 20, paying twenty-five percent coinsurance, thirty-five percent coinsurance. So the reality is not just access. It's then, can patients afford, based on uh, their, their premium and their uh, co-pays, co-insurance, can they afford to take these drugs long term? Okay, let's continue walking me through this, all right? What does a patient have to do uh, to get approval for these agents? Age older than 18, 18 or older, that they have tried and failed, or it's a contraindication to have tried at least two other agents whether, and we give usually a choice, the antidepressants, the anti-epileptics, um, <clears throat> the beta blockers. So as long as you have tried two of these agents for some health plans will have two months, others will have three months, but a period of time in which you have tried at least two other options. Um, and that's, and some will incorporate a, uh, I haven't seen a headache specialist because that, from a credentialing standpoint, you, there's some it doesn't, it doesn't require sense. a neurologist you cannot or headache it, But it's usually a neurologist or a specialist. Um, and that's, you that's know, it? in a, yeah, 90%, that's the prior authorization. So if I take my iPhone, I say, hey Siri, call my insurance company. And Siri says, how old are you? <laughs> and how, how long have you been on this? Otherwise I'm not calling. Uh, that's it? The patient can just call you? Can, can you call? Can, can an employer call and get this done like this? Well, it'd be the physician. Right. Uh, okay, so it has to come from an MD. Yeah. Or a DO, I mean a physician. Yeah. And that's exactly. it? And, and, you know, remember that um, most of these drugs are going to be prescribed by primary care physicians. And if the primary care physician is following evidence-based guidelines, uh, then it shouldn't be a problem and the guidelines that we've talked about. This all sounds like let's join hands and sing kumbaya. All's right in the world. But you sound agitated. What's going wrong <laughs> with this? It's, it's not, in theory, the system should work, but in reality, it really doesn't work. Um, part of that is because as far as treating migraine disease, the system is very broken in the very, very early stages in that on average, um, medical students only get four hours of training on all headache disorders in total, and even neurologists only get a couple of hours in general. And so uh, if you go back all the way back to primary care physicians, many of them have had zero education, absolutely zero, on headache disorders, and they don't necessarily have the time to read the AHS uh, recommendations, which, by the way, are fabulous. I love them. Um, and let, very let me reasonable. just stop you. Let me stop you. They're not talking about AHS guidelines. They said... 18 years of age, right. they mm -hmm. said you've got to have tried two, sometimes three right. drugs for a period of, fill in a number, two to three months. Sure. That's it. But there's so many obstacles along that way. First of all, when, first of all, the patient's got to get to the doctor, which even if they can get to a headache specialist, there can be a three to six month wait. Then the doctor has to submit it to the insurance company. Okay, the insurance company, in my experience, always denies the first time it requires a prior authorization or a formulary exception, so that goes back to the doctor. Or not the doctor, the doctor's office, who is often overwhelmed. So it actually doesn't happen or it gets lost in the paperwork. In the meantime, the patient is there saying, what has happened to my prescription? I can't work, I'm dying from pain, what do I do? And so the cycle goes on and on. You wanted to say something. Before we had the help of the specialty pharmacy, our office was psychotic with pre-authorization. And basically speaking, here's where it breaks down. You send the prescription to the specialty pharmacy, you have no idea whether the individual insurance company will make the one you, of the three you pick, first or second or third tier. That's the first step, but then you have to change the prescription. Then you have to provide documentation of the criteria, 
And after that point in time, this correspondence that goes up and back, it sometimes gets lost. <coughs> so we generally will allow up to a month for the pre-approval process because of these complications. Now, all of what you said sounded fine. What they're telling me sounds like real world experience. Where's the disconnect here, in your view? Because there seems to be one. Yeah. Well, I think um, many times it's the shuffling of the paperwork, it's where's the prescription. Um, the most common reason for denial is lack of information. Over 80% is lack of information. So if we actually could have um, a clear understanding of what are the steps you have to go through, make sure the patients also understand that, it's better for them because they're better. also yes. going through the, these lower cost options that if they don't work, they're also lower cost for the patient yes. and they're aligned with guidelines. If I were designing a form from your perspective, this form would have like four questions. What drugs have you been on? How did they work? How long have you been on it? Can I have the drug? And you would say, is that enough? Um, well, each health plan may have its own set of rules. Okay. But in general, what you outlined was, these are the drugs, this is the length of time you're on them, and if you failed, we'll approve this drug. Yes. So that's four questions. And the overall architecture is around the guidelines. I think we can all agree that ultimately there has to, this has to be evidence-based.